Good evening. I would like to thank everyone for joining our program tonight. I am Dr. Sonia Kella, breast radiologist and medical director at Adventist Healthcare Imaging Women's Imaging. I will be serving as your moderator tonight. We have great topics to cover, uh, which include breast cancer prevention, detection, treatment, and recovery. We have with us an expert panel of breast cancer specialists from the Aquilino Cancer Center, the White Oak Cancer Center, and Adventist Healthcare Imaging. Tonight's experts are Dr. Eva Duckett, my fellow breast radiologist from Adventist Healthcare Imaging, Drs. Sarupa Sengupta and Cynthia Plate, breast surgeons from Maryland Oncology Hematology, Dr. Senda Baltaifa from the Department of Pathology, Drs. Courtney Ackerman and Shannon O'Connor, medical oncologists from Maryland Oncology Hematology, Dr. Marie Gurka, radiation oncologist from Shady Grove Aquilino Cancer Center, and Dr. Luckman Dodd, radiation oncologist from Maryland Oncology Hematology. And last, but certainly not least, we have with us Betsy Jenkins and Lindsay Weiss from the Aquilino Cancer Center, both specializing in patient wellness. The knowledge that we want you to come away with tonight includes when to initiate breast cancer screening and the newer technologies in detection, how to identify those patients that require genetic testing and counseling, advances in breast surgical oncology, a basic understanding of breast pathology, medical oncology treatment updates, radiation treatment and technology updates, and finally, how to recognize the emotional needs of patients diagnosed with breast cancer and how our team at Adventist Healthcare places an emphasis on addressing these needs as an integral part of our treatment plan. If you would like to ask any questions at any time this evening, please drop them into the chat. We will get to them at the end. We'll start this evening with Dr. Eva Duckett, my fellow breast radiologist from Adventist Healthcare Imaging. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Eva Duckett. I'm one of the breast imagers for Adventist Healthcare Imaging. On behalf of my director of breast imaging, Dr. Sonia Kella, and the rest of the dedicated breast imaging team, I'd like to welcome you all. We currently have two full service breast imaging centers in our practice, one well-established center in Shady Grove and Rockville, and our new center in White Oak, located within the Orchard Center shopping mall near the new hospital. We also offer screening and diagnostic mammography as well as breast ultrasound at our Germantown and North Bethesda offices, as well as at our Blackwell office in Rockville. The primary message that I really wanna to convey tonight is that screening mammography saves lives. With an overall lifetime risk of one in eight women affected, breast cancer truly touches us all. If it's not you, it'll be someone you know. Since screening mammography came into widespread usage in the late 1980s, breast cancer mortality in the United States has actually fallen by over 35% after being unchanged and pretty much stagnant for decades prior to that. National Cancer Institute SEER data shows that since the 80s, breast cancer deaths have fallen 43%, while other studies have shown decreases between 35 and 40%. Numerous studies have shown that it is screening that is, has led to this dramatic reduction in, in death through early detection. I'd also like to end the confusion surrounding when screening mammography should begin and how often. There have been conflicting reports from some people and organizations, as I'm sure you've all heard, that are quite frankly dangerous. Reputable organizations such as the Society of Breast Imaging, American College of Radiology, American Cancer Society, American College of Surgeons, the American Society of Breast Disease, and so many others all recommend annual screening beginning at age 40. And that is for women of average risk, and that should continue yearly for as long as the patient is in good health. There is really no age cap or magic number to when screening should end. Um, I recently, unfortunately, broke my 
personal record of 96 and recently diagnosed a patient that was actually 101 years old. So the annual part of this recommendation uh, of 40 and every year thereafter is also quite important because as we're seeing now with the pandemic, skipping years actually leads to delays in diagnosis. And it's been about approximately 30% of cases that would have been detected earlier. So definitely get your patients in if they've skipped last year because of the uh, COVID crisis. Early detection also means less severe and less invasive treatments from our colleagues in surgery, oncology, and radiation oncology. A recent study by Laszlo Tabar published in the journal Cancer showed that women who did screen regularly for breast cancer have a 47% lower risk of dying from the disease in 20 years compared to those who do not screen regularly. This significant decrease on mortality through screening is thanks to many factors and improvements in imaging technique and modalities, as well as surgical and oncologic advances. For imaging, the advent of full field digital mammography followed by 3D tomosynthesis, as well as adjunctive imaging studies like breast ultrasound and breast MRI have all led to earlier detection. 3D tomosynthesis gained FDA approval in 2011 and is credited with continuing this reduction in breast cancer mortality. In addition to an accuracy improvement of nearly 40%, 3D also significantly reduced the number of callback exams or false positives. A study published in the journal Radiology in March 2020 followed five years of screening data with digital breast tomosynthesis versus digital mammography alone. And this study basically found that the favorable outcomes from digital breast tomosynthesis were actually sustained over multiple years, and that digital breast tomo tomosynthesis detected a higher proportion of poor prognosis cancers than digital mammography did alone. So obviously screening mammography is not perfect, but it is a powerful tool in the fight and it remains the gold standard for early detection of breast cancer. So until a cure is found and or a safe means of prevention, uh, labs will continue to be saved through annual screening mammography beginning at age 40. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Next, we'll be having our breast surgeons, Dr. Sangupta and Dr. Plate. I'm currently working with Maryland Oncology Hematology. I have an office in Rockville and an office in Germantown. And I've been in the community for about five years. Hi, I'm Cynthia Plate. Thank you so much for coming. I'm uh, one of the breast surgeons at our White Oak location. I have been with Adventist Healthcare for about 17 years now. And I have an office in the White Oak Medical Professional Building as well as office in Laurel. Okay, so to get started, next slide, please. The big trend in the updates for breast surgery are actually a trend towards de-escalation of therapy. A lot of our national meeting uh, focused on de-escalation of both treatment of benign and malignant disease. The Choosing Wisely campaign, which many of you may know about, actually took a look at um, all the data from multiple disciplines and came up with guidelines for both patients and providers to see where we could effectively and safely de-escalate therapy. Next slide, please. In the world of benign breast disease, the first recommendation was no routine excision of pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia or PASH in asymptomatic patients. Historically, anytime this entity was found, it was considered a high risk lesion and always surgically excised. We know now that there's a very low risk of upgrade for this particular lesion. And in most cases, unless it's associated with a mass or atypia, can be left alone and monitored. There is also a guideline to not excise routinely uh, biopsy proven fibroadenomas that are less than two centimeters. In general, a lot of women, especially our younger patients, will actually resolve these fibroadenomas if they're less than two centimeters. And the ones that do not change do not need to be excised at all. The third recommendation was to not take women with breast abscesses to the operating room unless uh, percutaneous therapy had been tried first. Now, percutaneous therapy is basically either an IND in the office or a needle aspiration. 
historically, anytime anybody had a breast abscess, we take them to the OR and kind of drain it and place Penrose drains and do a very uh, invasive uh, treatment for it. We've now learned that less invasive treatment can be equally as effective. Um, going sort of along with what Dr. Duckett said, there's a recommendation to not perform screening mammography in asymptomatic women who have a life expectancy of less than five years. So are very, very ill women. There's no reason to do screening mammography on them if they're asymptomatic, because it is very unlikely that a breast cancer will be what ends their life. Um, the last benign de-escalation was no routine drainage of asymptomatic breast cysts. We have so many women that come in regularly with cysts in their breasts that don't cause them any pain, they don't grow, they're just bound on imaging. These can effectively be left alone and drained or excised only if they become symptomatic. Next slide. On the malignant end, these are kind of our big practice changing guidelines for, for the majority of what we do. Um, there was a guideline to not perform routine MRIs in new breast cancer patients. The guideline that we pretty much follow is that if they have very, very dense breasts that may potentially hide any small lesions, those women should get an MRI, but women with very not dense breasts can actually effectively not have any MRI screening with a new cancer diagnosis. The second guideline, you'll hear us talk about this one a lot, no routine reoperation on patients who have invasive cancer if the cancer is close to the edge of the lumpectomy specimen. Colloquially, what you'll hear us talk about is no tumor on ink. So when you see a pathology report that says the invasive tumor is 0.3 millimeters from the edge of the specimen, that is considered effectively a negative margin. The research has shown that with the appropriate adjuvant treatment, there's very little risk of recurrence and a greater risk of morbidity going back to surgery for that type of margin. The next guideline was no routine bilateral mastectomy for unilateral cancer. I think this is one that's pretty um, natural to most of us now who are in the practice setting at this time, but historically a lot of women were guided to have bilateral mastectomies if they had unilateral cancer. Now we really do a tailored approach depending on the patient, depending on their risk, what they want, what their symmetry and their cosmetic um, desires are, and we make a decision based on that, but there is no routine recommendation to remove an unaffected contralateral breast. This next guideline is also practice changing for us. No routine sentinel lymph node biopsy in women over 70 with early stage hormone receptor HER2 negative invasive cancer. It was proven at this point that the risk of axillary recurrence was extremely low. And we can basically make all the treatment decisions we need for the most part for these women who are postmenopausal without any axillary surgery, which spares them any axillary morbidity. Um, we are also moving away, and this is a little bit, the data is still being reported on this, from performing axillary dissections in uh, patients who are having mastectomies, who have one to two positive sentinel lymph nodes. There is a trial that we follow now called the Z11 trial, which many of you are familiar with, which allows us to remove only one or two lymph nodes in patients who have lumpectomy. And even if they have cancer in those nodes, we do not have to go back for surgery in those patients. That data has now been rolled over to mastectomy as well. And these are pretty practice changing for us to allow us to de-escalate therapy and therefore decrease morbidity surgically in a lot of our patients. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Senda Baltaifa from the Department of Pathology. Yes, good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation. I'm Senda Baltaifa, and I'm an APCP certified pathologist with a fellowship in surgical pathology focused on breast pathology. I'm also certified by the College of American Pathologists in multidisciplinary breast pathology. And I work for Advanced Pathology Associates, a private practice um, contracted with Adventist Healthcare. And for the breast pathology update tonight, I would like to talk to you about the role of the pathologist and the multidisciplinary team for breast cancer patients. 
So traditionally, the primary responsibility of the pathologist is to establish the histologic diagnosis and the extent of the disease. So we determine the histologic type of cancer, ductal versus lobular, in situ versus invasive. We determine the tumor size, the grade, the lymphovascular invasion, the margin status, the number of, of lymph nodes, how many were removed, how many are involved by metastatic cancer, the biomarker status, and we perform the molecular testing. The pathologist is also the custodian of the tissue. Whether it's a needle core biopsy or an excision specimen lumpectomy or mastectomy, we are very actively involved in the tumor tissue journey. We look at pre-analytical variables such as cold ischemic time and fixation time that will impact the accuracy of the results. We also look at analytical variables and we help ensure the integrity and the preservation of the sample for downstream molecular testing. There are a lot of tests we perform in-house and some of the testing uh, is sent, being sent out to reference laboratories. We perform a comprehensive panel of breast cancer diagnostic assays that our colleagues, the clinician, um, will use to personalize their treatment to their patients. So we basically, in this day and age, we practice precision pathology for precision medicine. And the data we provide such as the hormonal status, ER, PR, HER2 expression by immunohistochemistry or HER2 amplification by FISH, PDL1 expression for certain types of tumors. Uh, all of these are in house tests. Examples of other send out tests are Oncotype DX and PI3 kinase mutations, uh, other germline mutations. And all of these markers provide objective observations on the tumor profiles, the behavior of the tumor. And this information will guide the adjuvant therapy and provide prognostic and predictive information. So basically, they predict the response to therapy and the risk of recurrence. Next slide, please. So each cancer diagnosis is as distinct as the individual it affects. And if our clinicians don't have the accurate diagnosis, they can't treat the patient appropriately and correctly. And we all know that today, the cancer treatment has shifted from the conventional model of one chemotherapy fits all to very tailored, specific, uh, targeted therapy characteristic of the tumor. And in our work, we implement the continuously evolving and updated quality assurance guidelines in compliance of the College of American Pathologists, our governing entity, the TNM staging of the AJCC and the um, NCCN guidelines. The bottom line of our work is a production of a pathology report that has important information everything that I was talking about in the last five minutes in a synoptic format, basically in a precise and concise manner for the clinicians to have all the information they need to treat the patient all in one place. Also, patients now have access to their pathology reports through the patient portal, so they can see all the information about their tumor. And as of today, the modern role of the pathologist is to serve as a consultant. We provide integrated interpretation of the morphologic, the molecular, and the clinical features of the tumor that drive the, the therapeutic decisions. And we like to think that we feel more closely aligned today more than ever before with our clinical colleagues, even though we don't see patients, but we are intimately involved in patient care, and we are here to support our colleagues who are in direct contact with patients. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce our medical oncologists, Dr. Shannon O'Connor and Dr. Courtney Ackerman, who will go over breast cancer genetics as well as medical oncology updates. Hi everyone, I'm Shannon O'Connor and I'm a medical oncologist and hematologist at Maryland Oncology in the Rockville division. So I have a Rockville office and a Germantown office and a Bethesda office, but I'm personally in Rockville and Germantown. Um, and I have a special uh, certification from City of Hope in LA in uh, clinical cancer genetics and hereditary risk assessment. Um, and I also specialize in breast cancer and female um, gynecologic cancers. Courtney, I don't know if you wanted to introduce yourself real quick, or do you want me to just go? Yeah. 
Go ahead. I can do it after you're done. Perfect. Well, I will start with the hereditary cancer genetic portion of the talk. Um, so I want to first focus on the fact that only about 10% of all breast cancer cases are hereditary, i.e. if we test all comers with breast cancer, we'll only find an identifiable gene in 10% of the cases. So most cases are actually sporadic. So most people don't realize that, but only 10% of the time you're going to find a cancer gene related to the cancer. 20% of the time, there is something called familial breast cancer. Now, what does that mean? That means the patient has a really strong family history, uh, but we can't actually identify a gene that caused their cancer. Um, we think that that's probably related to either how the genes line up next to each other or these little uh, mutations called single nu nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Um, and there's some patterns in families that may line up and um, increase the risk in that particular family, even though the genes are not mutated. So that's familial breast cancer. Uh, but again, 70 to 75% are actually thought to be sporadic. Uh, the other important thing to know is multiple genes are implicated in breast cancer. It's not just BRCA1 and 2. Um, next slide. I like this study, which was by a genetics company. Um, they looked at about 1,700 patients with breast cancer. Um, they did genetic testing. This does not mean that 68% had a BRCA mutation. It means that of the people who had a mutation, so about 12, 10 to 12%, 68% of those mutation carriers were we were able to find a gene in BRCA1 and 2. 32% um, though had other genetic mutations. So something else besides BRCA1 and 2 that did cause their cancer. And why is that important? Well, most breast cancer genes don't just cause breast cancer. Most cancer genes in general cause multiple types of cancer. So if we find a different gene, it's going to impact their screening for other types of cancer, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, um, pancreatic cancer. So it's really important to think of other genes besides BRCA1 and 2. So the current standard is actually to do panel testing. So that usually includes anywhere from 20 to 30 to 84 genes. We have an 84 gene panel that we can check that includes all cancer genes, not just breast cancer genes, but also the Lynch syndrome genes, uh, genes for pancreatic cancer, melanoma, et cetera, everything you can think of. So there are 84 identifiable cancer genes that we can check for at this time. So it's really important to remember 32% of breast cancer patients who have a mutation are going to have a mutation in something that is not BRCA1 and 2. Um, next slide. So this slide is a little bit hard to see, but this is actually a chart of just some of the breast cancer genes, not even all of them. Um, I couldn't include that in the slide. Um, and actually, even since I made this slide, there's actually changes. I made it a couple months ago um, and a couple of things have already changed. The world of genetics is changing very rapidly, um, really almost day to day. So this chart on the left, all the genes are listed there. ATM, BCR, BRCA1 and 2, CDH, CHECK2, um, PALB2, which was actually in the news recently. So I have a bunch of patients asking me about PALB2, um, P10, TP53, et cetera. This is just to name a few. Now, the little check boxes are the other cancers that these genes cause besides breast cancer. So as you can see, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, melanoma, um, uterine cancer, et cetera. So it really does impact the patient's surveillance um, if they have one of these genetic mutations. And so we might not change what we're doing for that particular breast cancer, but it will change the surveillance for other types of cancer. It may even be something as dramatic as removing their ovaries or removing their uterus and ovaries or frequent colonoscopies, including one to two years getting a colonoscopy. So it makes a big difference. Some of the things that changed on this chart in particular is the gene NBN, which actually has been downgraded as to being not associated with breast cancer and not associated with any other cancers. And that's a new update just from a month ago. Um, so that's actually been taken out of the guidelines and it's going to come off of our panels. We're not even going to check for it anymore. So it was a gene that we used to think was um, going to predispose people to breast cancer um, and actually sarcomas. And now it's actually been downgraded as being probably not a huge deal. So we're not even going to check it anymore. Um, so anyway, so this is ever changing. Um, so again, it's really important to have your patients, if they have a family history or if they even have a history of cancer, to meet with a genetic specialist um, and decide if they need genetic testing if they haven't had it. Next slide, please. So this is who needs to consider genetic counseling or testing. 
I don't have a slide big enough for this either because there's a lot of criteria and they're really hard to remember, but I tried to summarize it into something you could remember, which is anyone with breast cancer, any person with a history of breast cancer ever in their life, it doesn't matter how old they are, should consider genetic counseling and testing. Um, and that is a recommendation by the American College of Breast Surgeons uh, because again, like I said, some of these genes are going to cause changes in their surveillance of other types of cancer. So it may not change their breast cancer management, but it may make a big difference in preventing a colon cancer. Anyone with ovarian cancer needs to consider genetic testing for the same reason. Um, other Most genes don't just cause ovarian cancer, but are going to cause something else. And there's some treatment um, options for breast and ovarian cancer that are going to change depending on if they have a genetic mutation. Most patients with metastatic cancer, for the same reason, we have these drugs called PARP inhibitors, and they are only indicated in patients with metastatic cancer who have a specific gen genetic mutation. So all of our metastatic cancer patients are getting genetic testing at this point, mainly for treatment decision purposes. Um, and now this is the more complicated category, which is the family history of. So maybe your patient doesn't have active cancer, but does have a family history of cancer. There's very different guidelines all over the place, but the way I like to summarize it is just think anyone with a young breast cancer in their family, not themselves, but in their family. So you could use the age 45 or 50. For breast cancer, it's really under age 45. For other cancers, it's under the age of 50. Um, so anybody in the family with a young cancer, consider sending them for genetic counseling. Anybody with a family history of ovarian cancer, same thing, because BRCA1 and 2 and Lynch syndrome are pretty common um, in ovarian cancer. Cancer. So even if it's just in the family, think about sending them for counseling. Again, anybody in the family who has metastatic cancer, um, our genetic carriers tend to have more aggressive disease and hence tend to either present or eventually end up with metastatic cancer. So if that's in the family, you need to think about a genetic mutation. Um, multiple family members on the same side of the family with a cancer, any cancer, doesn't really have to fit a pattern and we don't expect you to know what the pattern is, but just three cancers on the same side of the family is a bit of a red flag. Um, and there's also some new guidelines around the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Really any Ashkenazi Jewish patient with any family history, which is almost everybody, right? So any family history anywhere of any cancer, they need to consider genetic testing because there's a really um, high prevalence of BRCA1 and 2 and some other particular genes in the Ashkenazi population um, that we really don't want to miss. Um, next slide. So key takeaways are, again, most cancers are not genetic, um, but you should really think about referring to someone like myself or another genetic specialist if they have a strong family history or even any history of, of cancer themselves or in their family. Um, the other important thing is don't forget to actually collect a family history. People forget that all the time. So I know you're busy doing other things, but just a quick ask, does anyone in your cancer have family? Anyone with ovarian cancer? Are you Ashkenazi Jewish and do you have any family history of cancer? And that's going to actually lead to a lot of people that need genetic counseling. Um, and again, most cancer genes are going to cause other types of cancer and most breast cancers are not only linked to BRCA1 and 2, but there's a lot of other genes that need to be tested. And anyone who had testing prior to 2014 really needs to consider update testing because we really didn't know about all these genes. Like I said, just even a couple of weeks ago, we had a change in our recommendation. So anybody who had old genetic testing probably only had BRCA1 and 2, probably did not get a panel. Um, so therefore, they would need update testing. Um, and not all the BRCA1 and 2s were the complete gene sequence. So again, that needs to be considered. So if they had remote testing, consider update testing or just refer them to someone like myself, and we can decide if they need update testing. And that's all for me. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Courtney Ackerman. I'm one of the medical oncologists. I work for Maryland Oncology and Hematology in the Silver Spring office. So we're in the um, pavilion at the White Oak Medical Center. So I'm um, also certified in genetics and do a lot of genetic counseling as well, but I'm gonna do the medical oncology updates. Tonight, um, I tried to make it succinct and just talk about kind of the newest, latest and greatest things that we have in our field, because it does change quite a bit and quite frequently. Um, next slide. So um, I wanted, there have been two recent um, sort of recent-ish new updates in terms of um, neoadjuvant chemo. So chemo um, before surgery to try to 
um, shrink the tumor, downstage the axilla, and allow for um, better surgical outcomes as well as sort of real-time assessment of how the cancer is responding to the treatment. So one of the newest ones is for um, triple negative breast cancer. It's a um, trial that was called Keynote 522. So the details aren't really important, but the biggest thing to know is that um, in triple negative breast cancers that are greater than two centimeters or greater than one centimeter and lymph node positive, we have this new option of not only giving chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting, but adding immunotherapy pembrolizumab to it. So um, as most people know, triple negative breast cancer is one of the more aggressive, um, higher risk of recurrence types of breast cancers. So having a new tool in our toolbox to try and help these women achieve a cure is really been a huge, a huge advance um, and something that has been practice changing in the last few weeks. It really was just approved just a few weeks ago. Um, another subset of women that tend to have more aggressive cancer is our HER2 positive disease. So we also have a neoadjuvant protocol for those women, which we've been using for a couple of years now um, that helps women to um, achieve a pathologic complete response. So we give the chemotherapy up front, and when they get to surgery, our goal is that they have a pathologic complete response and that we can't find any evidence of the cancer when we, have, when we take them to surgery. Um, there are always new drugs and new advances that are coming out. So um, we've been giving TCHP, which is the chemotherapy for several years, but we now have a subcutaneous formulation of the two targeted drugs which now um, is another added benefit for patients, less time in the chair, um, more convenient, um, easier administration. So um, next slide. Um, so adjuvant therapy for, um, pre or for hormone positive women. So there are some updates recently in that as well. So the last few years we've been doing um, um, in high-risk premenopausal women, we've been doing ovarian suppression with their hormone therapy instead of just putting on tamoxifen. So if we identify women that are at higher risk of recurrence and that are young and premenopausal, we have the added um, option of giving them ovarian suppression with their hormone therapy. Um, one of the newer things that came out within the last month or so um, was the Monarch E trial, which is looking at adding a drug that we've typically used in the metastatic setting, adding that in the adjuvant setting, so the post-operative setting, to women that have high risk early stage, you know, node positive, hormone positive breast cancer. So this is also been a huge advance and something that's been really exciting for us oncologists that treat a lot of breast cancer, um, then in these women that have node positive disease and high um, KI-67 that we can give them, in addition to just standard hormone therapy, we can add in this drug to improve their progression-free survival and hopefully their overall survival. Um, so this is one of the newest things that we've started doing. And it um, we give this for two years and then continue on with the standard hormone therapy after that. Next slide. So just a couple of slides about um, metastatic disease. So I broke it down by hormone positive and then HER2 positive and triple negative. So just um, a few little blips about each. So um, as Shannon sort of alluded to before, um, both Germline genetic testing to look for targeted mutations is very important in anyone with metastatic cancer. Also, genetic sequencing of the tumor tissue itself is extremely important in looking for targeted mutations and um, ways to personalize treatment for patients based on the pathologic and molecular characteristics of their cancer. So we've been using um, CK4-6 inhibitors for a while. Those are the class of drugs I was just talking about. So we've been using them combined with hormone therapy for quite a number of years in hormone positive um, metastatic disease women. Um, 
There's also a mutation that's called PIK3CA that has a targeted oral drug that we can use for hormone positive metastatic cancer. And also um, that we talked a little bit about before was PARP inhibitors. So in women that have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, um, we have targeted oral drugs that work extremely well in those women to help treat their metastatic um, breast cancer. Next slide. So in um, HER2 positive disease, we have um, lots and lots of drugs in this arena, which is really great. Um, you know, even probably 10 years ago, HER2 positive disease was considered to be a bad thing, but now I, I really consider it to be a good thing because we have so many targeted options for these women um, through multiple lines of therapy. So we have, um, some oral options with um, Takaiza and Zalota, and those are especially that regimen is especially useful in women with brain mets. It crosses into the blood-brain barrier. Um, we have a um, antibody drug conjugate, which is in HER2, that um, can be used right now in the third line setting, but there's studies ongoing looking at it in the first line setting. And we actually have that trial open in our office, which is a really exciting trial, looking at moving this great drug up into earlier settings for these women with HER2 positive metastatic disease. Um, and we also have other drugs. There's another drug called Mergenza, which is also a targeted drug for HER2. So, you know, the traditional ones that people have heard of, Herceptin, Pergetta, we have so many more drugs now besides just those that we can use in these women to really um, keep them being treated more like a chronic disease where we can really treat them for years and they can have good quality of life and, and extension of their life with all these new available treatments that we have. And then in the um, triple negative setting, triple negative still remains one of the more difficult subtypes of breast cancer to treat. Um, again, you know, sequencing of the tumor for targetable mutations, as well as germline sequencing to make sure they don't have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation is really important. When we do um, the sequencing of the tumor tissue, they look at most of the labs that we use look at 500 to 600 different genes, um, molecular mutations that can be found in cancers. So um, some of the you know, most notable ones are tumor mutational burden high, NTRAC fusion, BRCA1 and BRCA2 that we talked about, and then MSI high. So those are some of the notable ones that we have targeted treatments for those particular mutations. And there is one drug in the um, metastatic setting for triple negative breast cancer that was developed specifically for that subtype of breast cancer that is an IV um, treatment that's called Trudel-V. So um, although triple negative still remains a difficult to treat subtype, we are making advances even in that, um, even in that setting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to introduce our specialists from radiation oncology, Drs. Marie Gurka and Luckman Dodd. Hello, um, I'm Dr. Marie Gurka, and I practice over at the Aquilino Cancer Center in Shady Grove, and then also at the Adventist Healthcare Radiation Treatment Center in Germantown. And I would like to just give a few quick treatment updates today. I don't have any slides to share, so I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, but the main thing I would like to share um, with you all is really the trend in treatment for women with early stage breast cancer, uh, women who are being treated with breast only radiation after lumpectomy. It is now standard for these women to be treated in three to four weeks in most instances. And then for some patients, um, they can be treated even in one to two weeks if they have very favorable early stage tumors. Um, this is compared to traditionally when we would treat to five to six weeks of daily radiation treatments, which can be quite taxing for a patient. Um, some situations still require us to do those longer treatment schedules like post mastectomy or when the nodes are positive. Um, another trend too, along the lines of what Dr. Sengupta was mentioning, is also in de-escalation for older women with favorable tumors. Um, we now know women more than 70 with hormone positive stage one breast cancer 
uh, can often skip radiation after lumpectomy if they're going to be taking an aromatase inhibitor, um, which reduces estrogen in their bodies. Um, and they can have a, if they do the hormone therapy, the risk of um, recurrence is fairly low. Uh, radiation will help with local recurrence a little bit, but it doesn't change the overall survival. Um, so we are seeing more of that of you know, older women skipping radiation, and that's pretty standard now in that situation. Um, we're also looking at that in um, pre-invasive breast cancer and DCIS. We're starting to have some predictive uh, biological tests that can look, um, you know, the DCIS and try to predict if those patients will benefit from radiation or not. There's one called Decision RT that I've started to incorporate into my practice to see um, if women can safely avoid radiation after lumpectomy for DCIS. And they do have a registry trial open that I make an effort to enroll women on. Um, and those are kind of some of the big trend changes in radiation, you know, shorter treatment schedules, um, trying to pick treat patients who can skip the radiation. Um, and still have a good oncologic outcome. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Dodd and he can give you some technology updates um, from his standpoint. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Gurka. Uh, I wanna thank everyone, the primary care doctors, the family medicine specialists, and um, people from the community to be a part of this tonight. It's also really a, a proud moment to have this multidisciplinary team uh, speaking together during Breast Cancer Awareness Month on a topic that's really important to all of us. And so I'm, I'm right now at ASTRO, which is the American Society for Radiation Oncology annual meeting. It's the 63rd annual meeting. It's taking place in Chicago. And just as Dr. Gurka has helped highlight, there, there are four um, repetitive sort of take-home points that are, have been recurring at this meeting. The first is the relative equivalence of the shortened courses of radiotherapy compared to conventional. The second is that partial breast irradiation now has 10-year mature data, and the ASTRO guidelines will likely be evolving to include that as standard of care. And then there's the uh, meeting's general theme of embracing change and advancing person-centered care. And for all specialties in cancer, it's really important to make sure that we think of our patients holistically um, and, uh, we're, and remain concerned about not only their experience with their um, outcomes, but also their experience as a patient in our clinics. Um, finally, the fourth is sparing normal tissue. So what we'd like to do, uh, Marie and myself, is to reassure our colleagues in the audience that both at Shady Grove and at White Oak, we have the technology to spare critical normal tissue, particularly the heart. So at White Oak, we take advantage of um, a deep inspiration breath hold technique, which helps pull the heart away from the chest wall or breast field. And um, the importance of that came from back in 2013 when Sarah Darby published in the New England Journal of Medicine the um, relative risk of causing major coronary events with each gray of radiation to the heart. So we uh, both, at both Adventist sites, we implement techniques such as deep inspiration breath hold, uh, multi-leaf collimation, which, which is essentially beam blocking um, to help shape the beam to come off of the heart. And third, that I know Dr. Gurka does in her site, is prone breast. So those are three different ways that can be implemented. And we also at MOH have an affiliate partnership with the Maryland Proton Treatment Center. And so uh, what we wanna make sure is clear is that when um, patients come to us, we consider um, the, all of these issues and at our hands have the technology to optimally treat our patients. So with that, I'm gonna um, turn it over to our moderator. Thank you so much uh, so far to all of our physician experts tonight. Next, I'd like to introduce Betsy Jenkins and Lindsay Weiss, both specialists at the Aquilino Cancer Center, specializing in wellness and patient navigation. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Lindsay Wise and I'm the social worker here at Aquilino. Um, and we all know when patients hear the, word you, the words you have cancer, it can be very overwhelming and frightening for our patients and their loved ones. 
And so here at Aquilino, we really um, take a whole person approach um, to caring for our patients and making sure that we're addressing all the psychosocial concerns that may come up. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next, yeah, that one. Um, so here, um, here's a list of all the different um, support services that we have here at Aquilino. So my role as a social worker, I do provide supportive counseling um, for patients to adjust to um, a new illness, you know, a new diagnosis or going through treatment or even afterwards. Um, and all of our support is, you know, available for patients at all um, points in their journey. Um, I also connect patients to a variety of different resources. Um, financials is a big concern that comes up. Um, oftentimes patients aren't able to work. Um, and so connecting them to a lot of different financial support. Um, and then also offering uh, caregiver and family support. Um, we also have a registered uh, dietitian, Patty, um, and she helps our patients not only with weight loss or weight gain, but also with um, addressing any um, uh, you know, taste changes that may come up while they're going through treatment or um, any side effects that they may be experiencing. Um, we have our nurse navigator, Michelle McBride. Uh, she provides assistance with transportation, arranging um, help in the home. Um, and she also started a WIG program here for our patients um, through eBeauty, which has been a great success. Um, something really special that we have here is a, called our Community Resource Specialist. And it's through a partnership through Caring Matters. Um, so this is a volunteer-based um, organization that provides uh, volunteers for um, people in Montgomery County that have a chronic illness. Um, and they really go above and beyond um, what, you know, looking at what people need um, while they're going through treatment. One example is um, our community resource specialist actually connected, um, was able to get um, a dog walker for the patient while the patient had surgery. And that meant a lot for that particular patient. Um, we also have a patient experience coordinator um, and he is ensuring that all of our programming and supports um, are meeting the needs of our patients by making um, uh, calls to our patients. Um, and then we also have our wellness program coordinator who makes sure that patients are able to access our um, programming and making sure that they're able to register without any um, issues. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I'm Betsy Jenkins and I am the wellness program manager and I'm also a counselor uh, here at the Aquilino. And I wanted to talk a little bit about our programming that supports the psychosocial and emotional needs of breast cancer patients. The slide provides a full list. So over the last year and a half, we have developed um, sort of a wide range of mind, body, spirit programming. But in particular, I wanna talk about two tonight. Um, yesterday, we had 11 women here in our Center for Healing, along with about 10 stylists from the uh, Temple Paul Mitchell Beauty School, and over 100 wigs for women to choose from. So helping women with body image and adjusting to life during treatment where they're anticipating or, or experiencing hair loss and making that normal and even making it an afternoon of fun and pampering is something that we really enjoy bringing here. It's a program called Beautiful You, where women choose a wig, they have it styled so it actually looks well, they choose it to look so it expresses their style. They get to meet each other and have their first experience talking to other women, often going through the same thing that they are. Um, the other piece I wanted to talk about is the need for connection to others who really get what you're going through. So your family and your friends can provide the most wonderful support, but often they don't really get what you're experiencing. So we partner with Hope Connections and we offer a program that is a four session support group for newly diagnosed patients. And um, it's offered several times a year, basically about once a month. And this provides a chance to find normalcy, um, caregivers participate and can make bonds with other caregivers that oftentimes last throughout the journey. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Um, 
So thank you all, uh, all of our experts tonight. Um, for those of you in the audience uh, that want to reach out to any of our experts, Melissa will be in touch with you via email to give you contact information. So um, next, I'd like to just go ahead and move on to some questions um, that we received in the chat. So first question. How do patients feel during radiation for breast cancer? As in, what are the acute side effects? And I'm going to address this to Dr. Dodd. It's a great question. Now with the um, shortened courses, we're seeing a lot less fatigue and I think quality of life. You know, I was talking earlier about the whole uh, person-centered care. And so we need to, as a field, um, we're, we're starting to acknowledge some of the evidence that um, we've learned from. And so the side effects formally, when we had longer courses of radiation during treatment, often patients would have fatigue, but now with the hypofractionation course, we, have, we see less and less fatigue. And the other short-term side effects include skin changes, some redness, but there are modern techniques um, that both Dr. Gurka and myself uh, implement in our clinics that help us reduce hot spots in the patient's breast tissue, which is tends to be associated with some of the um, worsened skin reactions that can be seen. So it's really a balance of getting patients through their course and helping, you know, we see them uh, once a week during their um, course of radiotherapy to address these short-term side effects. Um, but fortunately, with the data supporting short and cor abbreviated courses of radiation, the tolerance to the treatment has significantly improved. Thank you, Dr. Haddad. Um, Dr. Gurka, a good question came through about fertility. Does radiation affect fertility? So radiation therapy for breast cancer will not affect future fertility since radiation is a local treatment um, that's aimed at a target. So treating the breast tissue would not affect the ovarian tissue or future fertility. Um, in the treated breast, if it is after lumpectomy, it can affect um, the ability to breastfeed, uh, but the contralateral breast uh, would be unaffected. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is a genetics question. How much does genetic testing cost and is it covered by insurance? So I guess Dr. O'Connor, this one's for you. Yeah, that's a good question. So it is covered by most insurances, but the important thing is a lot of insurances do require a genetic counselor to see the patient first. Um, so it's important to refer to someone that is a genetic counselor certified in genetics like myself or Dr. Ackerman. Um, there's also some online um, genetic counseling services, which I don't love. Um, so we'd prefer kind of refer to an actual person genetic counselor. Um, so if you do get genetic counseling, most insurances do cover it. Um, if they don't cover it, the companies that we tend to use will do the list price of $250. So worst case scenario, if it's not covered, the patient will never pay more than $250 out of pocket. It used to be three to $6,000 and now it's $250. So even if the insurance doesn't cover it, $250 max out of pocket, so. Great, uh, moving along. Uh, here's a question for Betsy and Lindsay. Um, can you describe the whole person support offered to newly diagnosed cancer patients? Thank you. Um, as soon as a patient enters our system, they are fully supported by our whole navigation and wellness team. They have access to social work, to counseling, to nutritional counseling and support. But we've also developed that full suite of new patient um, classes. We have something called the First Step Workshop, which is the first step in a patient becoming familiar with all of the free support services here at the Aquilino, but also in our community. We also cover things like getting organized, being your own medical advocate, communicating with your family, and finding reliable resources. From there, we can go into a class that we call Good Nutrition for Cancer Care, which is basically a nutrition one-on-one -on -one for eating healthy, preventing breaks in treatment, mitigating side effects, um, and things like that. 
we have the new normal support group and the beautiful you programs which i discussed um, previously then we have all of our yoga our mindfulness based stress reduction our expressive arts programs and we have a new integrative health program as well Okay, wonderful. Um, one last question, and I guess I'm going to um, put this forward um, to um, our surgeons. When would a plastic surgeon get involved um, with a patient who needs breast surgery, specifically mastectomy? Thank you for the question. So, um, as soon as a patient decides or we you know, recommend a mastectomy, we send them to the plastic surgeon right away. Um, they have the consultation with them. In general, surgery can be either implant or your own skin flap from different areas of the body. So that's up to the plastic surgeon to decide and the patient as well. Um, so we get them involved right away because obviously we can't uh, schedule their surgery until uh, we coordinate our schedules with the plastic surgeon. There is actually a, a big thing about going flat. It's actually, that's what's called is going flat. And a lot of patients, you know, they just want to get the surgery done and they decide to go flat and not have any reconstruction. But what I tell them is that it doesn't close the window on reconstruction. They can always change their mind and see a plastic surgeon afterwards. So that's the benefit of if they decide they don't want to do it at, at the time that we do the, perform the mastectomy, because that's usually when the first part of the reconstruction will be done, they can always go back and do it later. So thank you again to our expert panel, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope that you came away with some of these takeaway points. And again, all of our specialists here are available to serve you, um, and you will get our contact information. Um, next, I'd like to go to the giveaway.